we are now, 40 years on, talking about Bohemian Rhapsody. It was just another track that we thought was great at the time, but we always thought we were great. You know? And, um, you know, we always had this insane belief that we had something that no one else had ever ventured to create. I don't think we would have imagined that 40 years later people are still that excited about it. Whenever you're releasing a record, you never know how well it's going to do. And you might have a hunch, you know, that think, oh, I think this one could be a hit, but you never know what's going to be massive. I think it's a lot of timing, a lot of luck. We were just um, writing like crazy. I mean, there was so much hunger there. We just had so much that we wanted to bring out. And so we had all kinds of songs. And Bohemian Rhapsody, it was basically like three songs that I wanted to put out, and I just put the three together. And then it had a very big risk factor, yes. <laughs> Let's talk about the very early days. All right. Shall we, right? <laughs> so what did you do? Put your kit on your back and come up to London? Well, no, um, not really, actually. I sort of uh, I came up and did dentistry in London. I did electronics. I was going to be a, a graphics illustrator. Well, it was going to be astronomy. It was going to be physics. And I suddenly realised that I couldn't stand not being in a group. I had a group called... Um... I dread to tell you. No, I won't tell you what it's called. <laughs> oh, go on. <laughs> I think it was called the, uh, the Mind Bottles. We needed a drummer, so we advertised it in my college notice board. We need Ginger Baker, Mitch Mitchell type drummer. <laughs> and uh, Brian Mike wrote me this long involved letter, and he, he sounded quite intelligent, you know, because he liked Jeff Beck and Jimi Hendrix. So I met him, and we got on very well. And that was the sort of beginning. The singer of that band was a guy called Tim Staffel. So the lineup at this point then was drums, bass, and guitar. And guitar, but everybody sang. Right. And Tim was the lead singer, he had a tremendously powerful voice. He's done a few things. Too. I used to follow sort of Smile a lot, you know, mm. and we were like friends. I used to go to their shows and they used to come see mine. Brian and I were a sort of duo before. Well, we, we were. You know, we worked together before, and we, we knew we worked together well, and we respected each other's musicianship, and Freddie really caught on to that. Freddie was always so keen, and he literally sort of taught himself to play, to understand chords on the guitar, et cetera, et cetera. And then he joined a couple of bands while we were in Smile. Which had Freddie had any experience at all? None time? at all mm. before Smile was formed. Absolutely none, apart from Jeff Richard impersonations in front of his mirror. <laughs> He didn't suddenly become this rock star. He kind of always was, in a sense. He always believed he was a star. And he'd wander around as if he was Robert Plant, really. <laughs> you know, but, but with a sense of humour, you know. What did you see in what Brian and Roger were doing with Smile? Nothing. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think they had the basic uh, ingredients of what we wanted to do, which was a sort of couple, just very briefly, a couple sort of hard rock with... Uh, an overlay of harmonies, you know. Do you think the Queen sound is there in Smile, isn't it? I think a lot of it is. Yes, it is, really. I think the basis of it is, is when me and Roger start hitting things. <laughs> and that's what Freddie saw and, in a sense, fell in love with, I suppose. You know, he wanted that for his... for his uses. <laughs> we split up two or three years later, completely disillusioned because although we'd had a lot of successful gigs and we played colleges and we played pubs and small clubs up and down the country, we just never got anywhere. We didn't have a good manager, we didn't, we didn't really have anything, you know, we were lost in the wilderness. And that was really the chastening experience which, which led to, to the way we decided to organise Queen. I think that was perhaps the biggest influence of all, the failure of that early venture. Freddie sort of... Got us, he said, come on, you can't give up. Then I want to sing for you. And nobody really took him that seriously, but he really sort of uh, fused it together. And then there was, which made a core of, about, of the three of us. So we decided we'd, uh, uh, you know, take the plunge. And uh, it was then, then I sort of thought about uh, 
the name Queen, you know, I had it in the back of my mind. I thought um, one day, you know, that, that could be, uh, we could put that to good use. Why Queen? I don't know. At the time, it was, uh, it was outrageous. It was very grand, you know, very pompous. The name sort of lent itself to a lot of things, the theatre and the kind of things that we wanted to do. We then spent a couple of years looking for a bass player. We had several bass players. Very hard to find the right guy. They had quite a few bass players, I hear. I never actually met any of them. I've heard some stories about... <laughs> I've heard some stories about some of them. And I happened to have got my equipment down in London, so I got myself introduced to them and said uh, I'd be interested. So basically, I went along for an audition. I learned some of the songs, you know. Uh, they were doing a lot of the, uh, some of the numbers. I remember things like um, Great King Rat and uh, one or two other numbers off the first album. very much well formed you know I mean they had all the material for the first album all bar one or two tracks they were already doing you know they I mean they, they had a quite a backlog of, of songs and 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 the ideas for stage production and you know how to put the group over were all there in a way as soon as John was in the band it felt complete I think we all knew that that was the lineup as soon as John was there you know previously it'd been bass players came and, and went but John felt like he was part of the family, and we were a family from that point. It was only a, you know, a spare time thing, you know, even really, even with Queen, you know, I, I really didn't expect it to take off. I think John only realised that the whole thing was actually serious when we actually had an album that came out. <laughs> I mean, up until then, he thought, oh, this, I'll just tag along with this. I'm not going to say we were uh, harmonious the whole time, because we weren't, you know, we used to have a lot of differences. Right, take two. But we did feel that we shared something that was special. And so when we got knocks from the outside, we thought, huh, screw you guys, we know better than you. We know what we got and you don't. So there is great strength in having a good kind of democratic bond between the band members. We were still a group of people without any contacts in the music business, without any way in, it seemed. I used to go and see groups at the market and think, now, how do you get to that situation? And the answer was that people want to book you if they've heard of you, if you've made a record or something like that. How do you get to make records? Where well, do you get to make records because if you've played at places like the Marquee where people notice you? And it was definitely head up against brick wall department. <laughs> First of all, we decided we were going to be ready when the opportunity came. So the first job was to rehearse and write to the point where we thought that we had an act worth presenting to the public. The second thing we thought was to make it a good demonstration tape. So one day this chap turned up, who's a friend of a friend, basically, working at Delane Lee Studios, the new Delane Lee Studios in Wembley, which was just being built, and they were testing the acoustics. And um, he said to me, we need a group to come in here and make some noise so that we can test all our lines and the soundproofing and whatever and in return, we will make some tracks. I remember being on the train, you know, with Fred. Can you believe it? He did used to travel on the train. I hated every second on it. And we were clutching this one little reel of tape, and that was our entire future, in that little tiny reel of tape. And uh, I remember thinking that, <laughs> that's our future. And it was a hard slog round, you know. It didn't come overnight. Basically, they all said no. <laughs> yeah, basically, no, fuck off and don't come back. It was tough. We were all students, so we'd, we'd run out of student grant. I was actually teaching in a comprehensive school to, to make ends meet. I drove the odd van. Uh, Freddie and I had a stall that one for quite a while in Kensington Market. We used to flog old Edwardian scarves and uh, uh, Russian fox furs. Uh, <laughs> um, 
don't think Brian would have liked that very much. The first three years were really uh, faith and fumes. We were very uh, penniless, but we had a lot of faith and we had a lot of energy. The band was first brought to my notice in 1971. My brother went and saw them at a nurse's dance in Norwood. And he came back and said they were really amazing. I was bought some tapes from Delaney's sessions that had taken place. And uh, we listened to those, these test sessions, and we realized the band had amazing internal drive. Queen caught my imagination, really, by just their own ability, the way they worked together as a four-piece. It was totally interlocked in their thinking, their playing. And uh, that was different to what was going on. Well, I loved a million women in a belladonna case, and I had a million dinners brought to me on silver trays. Give me everything I need to feed my body and my soul. I think it was the first song that we actually wrote ourselves ever as Queen. I mean, there's a couple of things we tried before like when Roger and I were in Smile, but I think this is the first sort of Queen song. We finally signed to a production company who didn't really feel obliged to give us studio time except when the studio was empty. Well, we get a call at any time of day or night, and usually in the middle of the night. You know, it was basically, it was the off time of the studio. It was when, uh, when the studio had dead time and, and, and nobody was in. But we would sort of grab those hours and regard them as sort of gold dust. On the first album, we learnt a lot of the, the ins and outs of the studio. We started working with Roy Baker, really, who's a very technical, technical whiz. He could actually enable us to do all the ideas that we had, you know, and to keep it under control, all the technical things that we wanted to do in the studio. He was, he was able to, to, to put those into, into effect for us. We had a clear picture of what we wanted to do. There were certain fixed ideas we had, and we were going to bloody do them, you know, whether people said yes or no. So at that point, was Freddie already established with Brian as the major writer for the band? Yes, I suppose so, because they were the ones that did most of the writing. Freddie, by this time, was sort of uh, remembering all his piano lessons. I remember lifting a dreadful old piano up to his top floor flat. <laughs> and he killed ourselves in the process. And Freddie sort of hammered out the songs which he wrote in the first album. Hard rock in those days was always sort of found this sort of in the blues way, where it was kind of 12 bars and lots of heavy crashing chords. Mm. And then there was the other side where it was, it was a lot of melodic sort of ballad type things. And I just thought, why can't the two come together? I mean, why can't you have a, a good melodic song with a lot of heavy content? And we just thought that would be that would be interesting. Mm. So I mean, subsequently songs like Liar. I have sinned, dear father. Father, I have sinned. Try and help me, father. Won't you let me in? So how long before the album came out was it recorded and finished? I'd say about a good year. Mm. Good year. And that year was spent doing what? Uh, giving free concerts for our friends, uh, playing the odd gig that we could scratch. We turned up at Bedford College once in London. There was nobody. We, we, so we treated it as a rehearsal and, and played to an empty uh, room. And I, I think about three people turned up in the end. So. You know, I mean, this is character building. <laughs> we went to this college in uh, somewhere in the Midlands and we played the first set. We were booked, I think, 20 pounds. We were paid to play a night and we played the first half and then there was an interval where they played the disco and we were due to go back on for the second half and the lady, bless her, who was the chairman of ENTS, came up to us in the interval and said, um, really good boys, um, we we've had a request and we went, yeah, what's the request? He said, well, the request is um, people would, would kind of like to have the disco in the second half instead of you guys. So we went, fine, <laughs> give us the money, buy. You know, but that's kind of a, that's a blow to your uh, confidence.
I remember Freddie and I used to get on the number nine bus, go up to Trident Studios in Water Street to try and talk to our managers day after day and say, why is nothing happening? What are we doing here? We got very angry and just said that we just need this record out because it's getting old and things are happening and leaving us behind. So it was a very, very frustrating time. The album came out and sort of resoundingly crashed. I mean, it did, really didn't do much. When you're recording the album, you tend to think, when you sort of first mix it, etc., you tend to think it's the eighth wonder of the world, which it invariably isn't. But um, we, were, we were always perhaps overconfident, but um, even arrogant, you know, we were fairly arrogant, yeah. But I don't quite know why. <laughs> <laughs> So Queen 2, then, was the next yeah. major stepping stone, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, by this time, we, we had actually managed to attract some attention. The moment we came out with the first album, um, it put us in an immediate heavy category. And um, to a lot of other bands, I mean, that would have meant, oh, great, you know, let's, let, let's do what the media expects us to do. But we didn't. I mean, we knew what, we wanted to do some, a particular thing, like, sort of, branch out into sort of actual songwriting. In Queen 2, we had very big ideas of writing things which had a very heavy substructure, if you like, but lots of melody and lots of harmony on top. So we gave ourselves the, uh, the go-ahead to, to get complex. How long did that album take, then, altogether? Well, it took about three and a half months, which in those days was an epic. That album was the first sort of... Uh, aesthetic nervous breakdown <laughs> producer that we'd had, because we worked all hours for months. It was the first sort of mammoth job we did. You know, we went about triple the budget that we were originally allowed. But because I think um, the record company and the production company were pretty sympathetic artistically at that time, and they kept hearing bits and saying, it's great, you know, okay, go on. Yeah. Anyway, once you're halfway through, they, they can't really get you to stop. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they want an album. I realised that the easiest way of getting a hit album is to have a hit single that has some musical validity. Um, that's what we thought, and that's what we were set about doing. And it happened very smoothly there. And Queen 2 came out, it had Seven Seas of Rye on it. Almost within two weeks, I think, the single was a hit. And the album went straight in as it was released, which was great for us, because we were in the middle of our own first headlining tour. We'd done our support tour, and then Mel Bush came to us. Uh, he was a pretty top promoter at the time. And he said, I think you guys can headline the next tour. And we were surprised. I remember thinking, wow, that's very quick, because normally you would 
support a few acts and build a following and then you would go on your headline tour. But he said, no, I feel you can do it. You can sell out all these places. And he gave us a big list. Newcastle City Hall, Manchester Free Trade or whatever, you know, all the sort of classic gigs that rock bands do. And he said, you can fill all these. And at the end, we're going to do the rainbow. Well, they're just about to build up their momentum again now with the new album, Sheer Heart Attack, released at the beginning of November, and a British tour which starts on October the 31st and which takes them through to November the 19th and a concert at the rainbow. The rainbow was almost like the pinnacle. Not long before, we'd seen David Bowie rise from obscurity to being able to play the rainbow, and it seemed like such a big deal. And I remember thinking at the time, how amazing would it be if we could do this? And I think it was only a year later that we actually did that gig. And live, of course, we very quickly became aware of the fact that you get one shot. So you've got to deliver, you've got to really capture people, you've got to move them, you've got to engage them. And we used to say deafen them and blind them and leave them wanting more. We had so many mishaps on stage, you know, power cuts were quite normal. Tell you what, we'll just pose and you just look at us. Anybody who'd like to pose with us is cordially invited onto the stage. It was nice, really, because the audiences were so friendly to us that it really didn't matter. They were very patient. It's a great feeling when you realise that, because I think when you're starting off, you think, what's going to happen if something goes wrong? You know, it's all going to go pear-shaped. But actually, you've got a great audience, and you've got a band who knows what it's doing, and no matter what happens, you can normally deal with it in some way. A word in your ear From father to son Almost immediately, we went on tour with Mark the Hoople. Yes. Which was, for us, which was very successful, brought us to so many new people. And a lot of them have stuck with us ever since. It's quite amazing, as a, from being a support act on a, a major tour, just a support act, people have actually stuck with us right through, you know. It was the first time we really got into the big halls, you know, the Madison Square Gardens, you know, the, the Forum in Los Angeles and, and the Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto, those sort of big things. We had some bad luck on that tour, because Brian, got hepatitis then, and we came, we had to cut the tour in half, come home halfway through, because Brian was very ill. So after the anxiety attack came sheer heart attack, yeah? <laughs> yeah, that was made in even more trying conditions, really, because Brian had just recovered, supposedly recovered from his hepatitis, and made this, that album. It made it, we started off in Wales, and Brian started collapsing all over the place. We found out eventually he had a, an ulcer and he'd had it for six years and it was just getting really bad. So Brian had to go into hospital and uh, the three of us sort of carried on and uh, did a tremendous amount of work on the album, leaving all Brian's bits out. And when he was well again, he came back and sort of did them mm. and slotted them in. And strange enough, it's, I think it's my favourite album. My particular favourite, obviously, is Now I'm Here. <laughs> Which also was written about America, presumably. It was, and, was and Mott. And, Mott. Yeah. and it was a sort of bit of a nod to Mott.
try. It's done very quickly at the end of the album, actually. Mm. Most of the album. Actually, it was a hit. Mm. Not as big. You can, we never seem to have as big a hit. It's very hard to get a rock and roll hit single anywhere. America or here or Japan. You know, people will always go for the more melodic things. She's a killer, queen, gun body, gelatine, dynamite with a laser beam, guaranteed to blow your mind. Our first album had done very well in Japan. The old cliche, big in Japan. So we were booked to do a tour there. We arrived in Japan and it resembled what we known as Beatlemania. You know, there really were thousands of kids. And it was Bedlam from then on. You know, they're all hanging out in the hotels, hiding behind curtains in the corridors, and uh, everywhere we went, we got followed. I understand that in Japan that you couldn't even leave your hotels. That's the it was immense very popularity. Difficult. Yeah, very difficult. Well, this time around, it was uh, we had we had to have bodyguards all around. And, um, you did it got, the kitchens. <laughs> in fact, yes, and we were sort of reduced to travelling in laundry lifts and things like that. <laughs> but um, the price of fame, they tell me. We're completely overwhelmed by what's happened since we came here. It's never happened to us in any other country to, in this kind of style. <laughs> I just want to say thanks to everybody for being so great. We feel really at home. Thanks for the presence and thanks for making such a noise at the concert. Hello, boys and girls. It's very nice to be in Japan. Thank you very much for um, the reception and the amazing welcome. <laughs> and from me and the boys from Queen, thank you very much. Sayonara. It was odd because, in a way, we were stars outside England before we were very well known at home. I'll just tell you what it's called. It's called Death on Trulegza. We were still very poor. Nothing had changed from that point of view. used to know, anyway. The first three years, we were with a company called Trident, right? And we were very badly handled. Well, not badly handled. No, we were... We were badly handled. <laughs> <laughs> There we were, we'd had three albums, and, you know, we were still there on a, on a, on a, on a basic wage, you know. I think we were on 20 quid a week at that point, you know, from our management company. I'm not exaggerating. I mean, it was that point where the managers are all building their swimming pools and driving their Rolls Royces, and you're thinking, hmm, <laughs> where did it all go? So there was a crunch coming. What we decided to do was go with a production company rather than with a record company. And the deal was that we made the album for the production company, which is something like a middleman. It's between the artist and the record company. We make the album for the production company. They sell it to a record company afterwards. And in retrospect, it's probably the worst thing we ever did. You suck my blood like a lead. So basically, we got out of that one, right, by uh, re-signing with a guy called John Reed, who also manages Elton. What a good El about that, Yeah. There was a, a moment where John said, OK, I can now do this. You're, you're going to be free of your old commitments to Trident. And you go away and make the best record you've ever made, and I will sort out the money side. So I think he put us on, like, 30 quid a week instead of 20 quid a week, and we were made. <laughs> Was do or die, really. I think if we hadn't made a night at the opera, it's questionable whether we would have been able to carry on.
this kind of feeling of abandon, I think, about the night at the opera. You know, we thought, no hell's barred, you know, no barriers. We'll do exactly what we think we can do, push ourselves to the limit, make the finest tapestry that we possibly can, and that will be us. There'll be no apologies. There's no kind of pandering to, to commerciality. We just make something wonderful that's always been in our heads. Can you tell us what Queen is all about? It's, it's a, basically a rock and roll band with lots of harmonies, lots of uh, everything. Can you uh, stay in one bag today and be safe? No, no, we're not. That's one of the things that I think people can put us into is um, one category. We just, we've got so many sort of, um, there's a lot of ingredients that make up Queen and uh, you can't put your finger on it really. Don't you hear my call, though you're many years away. Don't you hear me calling you? Write your letters in the sand for the day. It was night of the opera time, and we were just writing like crazy. I mean, there was so mm. much hunger there. We just had so much that we wanted to bring out. It was all sort of kept in, and so we had all kinds of fun. This is John's first hit, and this was uh, quite a big hit. That line, happy at home, I can remember, remember Roger going, I don't want that fucking line on here. We're not singing happy at home, for fuck's sake, it's rock and roll. What is this, the Women's Institute? <laughs> We'd really go in the studio and what have you got? You know, I've got this. And we would sort of hammer it out there. And it, so it, stuff happened really very much in the studio. By the fourth album, it was much more flying by the seat of your pants. It's kind of more interesting in a way. A more sort of natural growth from the band of developing a song. We don't look upon singles as sort of, I don't know, as the same other people look about singles, you know, like, I don't know, commerciality. I suppose that's one of the ingredients. But I think it's just our way of saying this is what we're doing at the time. And, mm -hmm. and we, we felt that Bohemian Rhapsody summed it up at that time when we were doing a lot of diverse things, a lot of complex harmonies. Mm -hmm. You know, it was full of extremes and we thought, why not? Bohemian Rhapsody had to, happened to be, uh, it was basically like three songs that I wanted to put out and I just put the three together. I'll take one of Mark II versions of Fred's The Thing. It's one of those songs I, I had a lot of fun in because I, I thought I'm going to do exactly as I please, do as many um, multi-layer harmonies as possible, you know, go well over the top. And, you know, didn't give a shit about anybody else. Fuck! We did a lot of things with piano-based drums, actually, yeah? uh, as, a, as a spine, as, as a core to everything. Freddie had a fantastic sense of time. So he was great to play with. He had a very tacking piano style and very definite, and it was very concise and precise. And uh, so it, it was really great to, to play, to make backing tracks with. Uh, so, you know, you had everything, really. You had the whole range, you had the piano, the melodic range, and bass and the drums. Still too slow. No, that's nice, that's nice. I'll tell you, it's, that is slower on there. It was a very strange song to record, in a way, because we actually did it in sections. I like that first bit. I like that first bit. So I'll come in from here now. Carry on. Oh, yeah, I remember doing one recording session in Rockfield. Oh, fuck, I missed, fucked it. Freddie was saying, right, these are the notes, and it goes dum, 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 and it seemed to have no connection with anything. One. 
but he had all the ideas of what he wanted to go on top. <laughs> Did you hear that? Pum yeah, jump! <laughs> it's too much. There was three of us and we all came in a bit later. <laughs> no, you didn't shout one or anything. You I know, I shouted one and came in myself late. <laughs> It's so fucking hot in here, I'm not kidding. I did kind of request the piece for the solo. I said, I, want, I would like to be soloing over a verse and I can hear something in my head which is not the melody of the song, but some sort of counterpoint to that. And so Freddie built that in to his, uh, his plan of the backing track. Still about writing for a second, Freddie. Mm. How prolific a writer are you? Oh, I write a dozen a day. <laughs> Usually, the way I write is I get the sort of melody first, because that's the most important. It comes easier to me anyway. Mm. I work out the melody, I work out the song structure, and then somehow the words fit in afterwards. Mm. Lyrically, I'm, I'm a very bad, actually. I really have to work. Fred's lyrics came from the left, from the right, from the... You never knew where they were coming from. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the bandango? Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. I never saw him reading a lot. I, don't know, I never saw him with a book, actually. No, I didn't see him. Yeah, I saw him with a Sotheby's catalogue, but, you know. He's just a poor boy from a poor family, sparing his life from this monstrosity. That is one aspect of Queen that people seem to like. They love the big chorale, the big harmony thing, which we, which we are sort of capable of doing, um, linked with a strong melody um, and perhaps a little touch of bizarreness, although not too much. Bismillah! No, we will not let you go. Let him go! We sort of came up in the end with everybody sings, the three of us all sing each line. And uh, Brian was sort of quite strong in the low register. Uh, Freddie was strong over the whole register and I was very strong on the higher register uh, in full voice and falsetto as well. But so we devised this sort of way of uh, getting that sound. It does encapsulate a lot of the different things which were Queen, you know, our sort of essential style which was still evolving at that time. So it's got the heavy stuff, it's got the melodic stuff, it's got lots of harmonies, it's got guitar harmonies with orchestrations in the guitars and the voices. Um, and again, it was just the four of us. And it does sound like a huge kind of <laughs> symphony ensemble with a choir and whatever, but it's just the four of us. <laughs> So we were, I suppose, consciously experimenting with how far you could push that studio technique to make something massive and grand and um, and um, and stupendous. And it did come out quite stupendous. He wrote me a letter about that and said, I study demonology and satanic things. Why do they use Beelzebub? Which, oh, and I suppose that's a legitimate question. <laughs> why do we use it? Yeah. It's just a... I mean, why do we use anything? I mean, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm, I study demonology and things. I just love the, <laughs> the word Beelzebub. I mean, it's a great word, isn't it? Well, there's a great vision from Freddie. You know, that was something very unusual, I think. And... Um, you know, it's only in retrospect, I think, we realised how, how unusual it was. But in a sense, it was part of the flow. It didn't seem that abnormal to us at the time. It was a very big risk. I mean, I remember Roger saying that it's one of those things that uh, we said, OK, it's either going to be a huge flop. As it was a song of extremes, you know, I, I thought that was the way we were going to approach it. We had this kind of perverse belief that, that our vision would be something that people would understand, so we, we didn't, we consciously didn't go the commercial route. The radios didn't really like it initially because it was too long, and, and the record company said, you know, you can't market it that way. And um, after me having virtually put the three songs together, they wanted me to sort of slice it up again. The record company all, as a mass, came to us and said, don't do this. This thing is too long. Nobody's going to play it. Please don't make us put out this record as a single, this Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, or else please let's edit it. And John actually delivered an edit. I don't know if this is a fact that's known. John Deacon went away and made a cut, which cut out all the operatic stuff. <laughs> Thank you.
did sound odd, and everybody else said it was odd, and you can't do it, and all that sort of thing. And and uh, yeah, you know, I was wrong. I just said it. It either, either goes out in its entirety or not at all. We just thought, no, that's what you're getting and we're not going to give you another one. So it was done that way, you know, and it was given a lot of help from people like Kenny Everett, and, you know, who is a sort of visionary, genius DJ. So, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time anywhere in this universal eyes, we present at this moment of time the new Queen single. He got right behind him, played it 14 times in the weekend on his show, uh, which really didn't hurt, you know. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the bandango? Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. We made a video for Bohemian Rhapsody simply because we were on tour and we weren't able to go on Top of the Pops. To be honest, we weren't too keen on going on Top of the Pops and standing on those little podiums yeah. and kind of miming the human rights. It would have been really crap. We used an outside broadcast sports unit to use their, bring in their cameras into Elstree where we were rehearsing. Uh, and we could go on the road and that could be on Top of the Pops and on television throughout the world then. Easy come, easy go, will you let me go? Bismillah, no, we will not let you go. And we realised, well, wow, you don't even have to be here to promote your record now. You know, you just make one of these little video films and that's got to be the way in future, you know, and, uh, and we were the first let to do go. that. Let him go, Bismillah, we will not let you go. I think it's the first video that actually took any kind of effect into actually making sales, you know. A lot of videos were probably made before, but I mean, they didn't sell records. I think it's the first one that actually sort of, there was this chemistry that actually linked visuals with the music and it worked. Oh, mamma mia, mamma mia. Mamma mia, let me go. Beelzebub has a devil put aside for me, for me. Night at the Opera changed the sort of financial outlook of things. Uh, after that, it wasn't so much um, uh, where's the next fiver coming from. You know, mm. It was uh, mm. very, very successful. It had a very successful single, obviously. We would just check it into one of the hotels and we realised that Bohemian Rhapsody had gone to number one. And, and the funny thing is, the four of us were in a lift. Uh, probably only the first time that it happened, because normally we have bodyguards and everything. We just, and we were jumping up and down, and the fucking lift stopped. So there we are. I thought, my God, here's the number one group in England, just going to suffocate in this damn lift. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Queen. And then we got a call saying, would you like to play live on Christmas Eve on BBC One? So we went, whoa. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It was a big honor, you know, and a big thrill and scary. You know, we'd never done anything live like that on TV. And we better be bloody good at this. We normally did a big dramatic entrance and everything was dark and there was lots of noise and smoke and dry ice and explosions and stuff. And so it gave you great confidence coming on the stage. On this occasion, they had the audience lit for TV. So we went on stage and kind of looked around and there were all the people's faces. It was quite nerve wracking. As soon as we were on, we were on, and it suddenly everything changed, and the audience kind of got up and did a lot of waving and a lot of noise, which was great, and we were into it. finished the tour, we'd already done four nights at the Hammersmith Odeon, and so this was a fifth night, and I think there was about a five-day period in between the end of the tour. So it was quite difficult. We were just starting to wind down, and actually then you've got to go back and do this one all-important show. And it was a big deal in the fact that it was going out live on Christmas Eve. Obviously, there'd be a really good audience. I remember thinking, ah, will we have lost our momentum and all that sort of kick-ass stuff that you developed on a tour? And I do remember being quite sort of worried about it. And I had a kind of flu at the time. And I, I remember feeling like absolute death. But the power of adrenaline is amazing. You start to sweat and work a bit, and, and you kind of forget about it then. Paris with Odin was sort of our local, I suppose. In Japan, we were expected to be rock stars and pop stars or whatever it is. But in England, you can't sort of strut around as if you were a star. 
We really felt we had to work very hard in England to prove that we were the real deal. Thank you and good evening, everybody! Now then, we're going to do a nice, tasty little medley for you. Just like the one we did the other day, yes. And we're going to start off with a little segment from a number called Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> Mama just killed a man, put a gun against his head, pulled my trigger, now he's dead. I guess every major act has a certain song which becomes their anthem, becomes their big hook on people's consciousness. We could feel the sort of whirlwind picking up. So 75 really was a, a, a great year for us. It put us from championship into the Premier League, if you know what I mean. Yeah, the Live Aid thing was unusual because it wasn't a Queen audience. All those tickets were sold before we were announced. The big shock was how well that audience knew us as opposed to the, the Queen audience, because they'd all seen the video. In a sense, that's the great signal that the video age had taken over and become the sort of major force in promoting rock music. Queen with a Bohemian Rhapsody, an incredible song written and performed by the matchless Freddie Mercury, who died on Monday. It's being re-released on the 9th of December, and all the proceeds will be going to the Terence Higgins Trust. Yeah, we re-released Bohemian Rhapsody, and it sold a million, which is a lot, you know, for singles. I mean, obviously, it would never happen now to anyone, but a million was a lot, and we donated all the profits to AIDS. Every penny. Magnificent performer, magnificent single, and a magnificent song sadly missed Freddie Mercury, who I think will be very pleased to know that he's almost certainly got the Christmas number one. At least this is the chance for something positive to come yeah, out so of it. So much positive can, can You can it, do yeah. so much. That's exactly what Freddie wanted, yeah. and uh, we intend to carry that through, and we're thinking of doing something next year, some kind of event. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, probably in his name, that will we'll be something positive and we'll raise a lot of money, we hope. Elton and Axel. Yeah, I mean, that's a moment to treasure. My dearest wish was to get those two together. It wasn't easy. Uh, there was a bit of controversy at the time. I think Axel had said some fairly unwise things. Elton was very broad-minded, terrific about it. Axel, of course, never turned up to any of the rehearsals. So they came on, and of course, Elton and he had never performed together before. I don't know if they'd even met before they stepped on that stage to do Bohemian Rhapsody in front of a billion people or whatever. And um, I, I thought it was an amazing, it's, it's one of the, the moments I will never forget in, in my life. And Axel comes on like this whirling dervish and canes the middle bit, just, I mean, it just rocketed to the sky.
they come together at the end, nothing really matters, and they end up holding hands going to the front of the stage. And we're looking at this on the back thinking, hmm, <laughs> who would have known that this would happen? And that was a really good joining together, I thought. It was an amazing night. So yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody came through again as, as a great moment of that, that show. There have been so many great songs over the years, those standout, you know, songs. It's just nice to have one of them or, you know, maybe the most popular one. You turn up someplace and do a whole show and you haven't done Bohemian Rhapsody, people look at you funny. You know that's going to be a sort of pivotal moment of the set. Adam is well capable of singing it all, but everybody wants to see Freddie sing a piece of it. It was just nice to design a way where Adam could do a verse, Freddie can do a verse. What is Bohemian Rhapsody about? Well, I'm thankful that none of us know, really. We all guess, we all have our own ideas. But Freddie never talked about it, to my knowledge and didn't want to. I think that's the way it should be. I get asked that all the time, uh, and I... I have no answer. Freddie would laugh. I mean, he's, Freddie's probably laughing at this moment at me trying to talk about it. But, um, you know, he had something in his mind, and what he loved was to spin these little pieces of magic. I mean, he was a songwriter, and that's what songwriters do. A little bit of reality, a little bit of fantasy, a little bit of something that expresses your emotions. And if anyone really tries to unravel it, they're never going to quite do it, because they're never going to quite know what went in, into those lyrics. Nothing really matters. One of the great things about it is that nobody can really say, they can say it's monstrous or whatever, but they can't say it's not good. We're lucky that we have a lot of hooks in people. You know, so many of these songs became part of people's lives, which is a great privilege. But Bohemian Rhapsody is a big one, and there's no getting away from that. <laughs>